In, in terms of social political consideration, how effective is a different, let's say, model, models generated? How will it impact? What is the experience with Brazil? You know, it's kind of tricky. We're, we're trying to develop these kind of things in Brazil yet. Brazil has a, a, a good program for establishing protected areas. And it's not necessarily based on that kind of approach, okay? But the good thing is that the Brazilian government is very, very concerned about involving people. So when we have a plan for establishing protected areas, it goes through a series of steps. So it will eventually be, become a law and a protected area. And one of these steps is going to the people and say, OK, we're trying to do that protected area here. And we are here to discuss with you what are, could be the benefits of having it here. Like, what is the use of biodiversity that you can do? How much uh, income it could generate by ecotourism or things that you can, uh, you can get inside the reserve? And what could be the disadvantages? What are the opportunity costs you have? And there is this discussion. They have um, people from the government talking with citizens and citizens expressing their concern about that. And if they eventually got to a consensus solution, then it will be uh, implemented after a while. If there is no consensus, then there is a great chance that that plan will not be implemented because it's not for the interest of the locals, for example. Uh, so we're trying to do that. We also have some kind of environmental lobby in Brazil. So we're trying to convince more and more people of the importance, the importance of that. And not only formally protected areas, but places within properties and the importance of having those places safe there and these kind of things. <clears throat> But you can rely on some creativity. I'll show you a work when we are measuring that kind of political willingness to act and to implement the plans. And you have different variables that you can measure. I will show you next. Okay. Did I answer that? Yeah. Okay, I have quite a number of things. Some of them are certainly not questions there. Mm -hmm. Comment. Start with uh, one of the last that you mentioned about the lack of proper data in planning. And this is very pertinent to what we are doing here because most of the countries, maybe South Africa not inclusive, but most of the countries south of the Sahara, we have that challenge. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to do proper planning in Uganda, I don't know what exactly I'll do because mm -hmm. first we don't have the data mm -hmm. and the little that we have has a lot of gaps in it, mm -hmm. and yet conservation is as urgent as yesterday. You're not going to wait for the data to accumulate mm -hmm. to start planning. So I'm just looking at how we can start. And that ties in with the other question on the new areas of interest. Uh, because of the challenges that I've already noted, much of our research is exploratory today. It's not, we are not yet, at least most of us are not yet at the conceptual level. The kind of research you're doing in Brazil and probably in the West is at a higher level. We are mm -hmm. not conceptual thinkers at this stage. Maybe later on, we are basically doing exploratory studies. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how best our interests can now be accommodated in the new ways of thinking in research. Mm -hmm. If I came to you and told you, I just want to identify, no offense to take a uh, the medicinal plants of Uganda, for example. Mm -hmm. I'm at that level. I'm not yet thinking about the dynamics changing all these things. So I don't know how we are going to contribute to the current debate mm -hmm. on research. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's for the beginning. I have the others. I don't know how okay. to discuss that. Part. Yeah, I don't know if this is a problem. You know, countries have different stages of uh, doing things. We are far behind. Uh, in Brazil, we're here far, far behind Australia or, or the US, for example. But this is not a problem. <laughs> this problem is how can you solve, how can you fill these gaps? Yeah. So when you don't have data, the obvious thing you could do is, okay, 
Uh, that place is, is, it has more species richness. Okay, then protect it. Okay, we get it protected and that's done. And it would be good to have data, but in some cases you simply don't have. And it is good to have a, a kind of this approach, like systematic conservation planning. But if you don't have data to do that, there is plenty of other options to prioritize places that you can have. So, any, it, that's my point of view. Anybody should try to use conservation planning because it will be cost effective. But if you don't have data to do that, if you don't have information about costs, if you don't have information about biodiversity distribution, then you have to rely on other things like expert opinion, opportunity, like there is this guy that is trying to protect everything, let's talk to, to him and get it done. So it could be good. In fact, Brazil is not quite using this kind of methodology yet. That's basically the same problem. So we have uh, the last review of priority areas. We did use some kind of, uh, we used the mark sand to, to find the most important places. But then we went back to experts and say, okay, do you rely that Maxian solution? It's kind of weird, because Maxian was developed to do so. But we get back to that experts, and some of them said, mm, I'm not sure. Perhaps you could have this area. But this just broke everything uh, you've done, because th that's not the idea. And that's because we have the same problem. So people will say, ah, I'm not sure about this data. I can't trust uh, the solutions you were given because there's so much uncertainty. I don't know where the database came from. I have my own data that I haven't shared with anybody, but they tell me that this place is very important. Oh, come on. So share it. And uh, see, I, I, don't ha I don't have an answer, but uh, you don't have to be worried about, oh, we're not using that kind of fancy stuff. That's not, that's not the issue. The issue is you must try to get the data, then you can try to do something like that. The most important thing, maybe, is to uh, foster initiatives that are trying to collect data, put data together, and share data to people that really matters. In the meanwhile, you just can't lose biodiversity. So you, you do priorities and prioritization with different tools, like species richness maybe, or rarity, endemism. Yeah, I, you want to add on to that? Because yeah, I, okay. Close to other yeah. uncertainties. Let's say the tool is not static, is able to make some predictions. What, are, what happens about those, you know, with the prediction, there's like this time limit to, to the next one. What about the, between the times, stochastic events? How, how reactive will the tool be? I don't know. <laughs> the, th the, thing, the thing is, uh, when we're working with that, the works that have been done with climate change, for example, the thing is can, you can only model climate in this large period. So there's no reason about talking about climate change from one year to another just don't happen. Climate will change in that time period of 30 years, 35 years. Uh, your hope is that if you're planning for uh, 40 years from now on, the action you take today will hold for the next 40 years. So a lot of things could happen in between, but you should be assured that the decision you, you have taken now was the best decision you could possibly have made by that time. And you, can, you need to rely that the way you developed the plan was the best way to assure persistence for this time. But again, you need to have some feedback if the plan is working. So you have to be some kind of monitoring to see if the targets are actually being achieved. But so far as I know, there is no such a thing being done in anywhere. Yes. You create a protected area and that's it. I just want to respond to your question just now um, in terms of, in our experience with Mark San and C Plan and conservation planning, we found 
we needed to do a certain amount of ground truthing. So you have to select random sites and go into the field and see is what you are modeling matching what is actually happening on the ground. So even if you don't have accurate data, you can still get quite a lot of good information by then picking or selecting random sites and going, how much of this model is accurately telling me what I actually end up seeing on the ground? Or do we need to, or are we seeing that it's completely different and therefore we know for a fact we don't have enough variables put into the model to predict what we need we need in, to answer in our question. Okay. So that might help a little bit. I know it's, it's more difficult at a country scale than at a, a city or a regional scale, but I think the principle is still the same. Okay, I just want to add a few comments. I, I noted that in the projection for the full, when we're looking at France and all the other countries, the difference between partial and full was not very big. Actually, in some of them, you have the same. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering whether under such conditions, I would want to go for a full coordination, given other logistics and other aspects, when I actually see a small margin between full and partial. Mm -hmm. Why would I go for full when partial doesn't seem to show? Yeah, maybe perhaps it's the, it's the particular case they have chosen for the paper. Because the full will be the whole, the, all the countries of, in Europe. Yeah. And the partially will be the countries in the European Union, which are the majority, and the other countries. So there's no that difference because there is an imbalance there. So we have much more countries that, that belong to the European Union than, than not. That was because I was comparing the uncoordinated with the full, because the uncoordinated would be each country by itself, and the full would be all the countries. Um, we have done some uh, uh, similar work uh, globally, trying to understand how can you include the costs of ag agriculture expansion. And we have also three scenarios. Each country working alone and trying to avoid agricultural expansion conflict and protecting biodiversity. Uh, totally globalized scenarios in which you have a really international um, agenda to do that. And there is this partial scenario that was uh, economic blocks. So you have uh, European Union, NAFTA, Mercosul and how it works. And we got basically the same answer. It's very different doing that alone as a country, and it's much better doing that globally. But the difference between the global and the economic blocks scenarios was not that high. Because you were putting uh, countries together and you were most achieving the targets uh, with all those countries together, and then the costs go low. The other is related to my past experience working um, with people from Brazil and people maybe from Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, I, is that the way we define land use in that part of the world compared to ours is very different. Mm. I worked on this project where we're looking at, uh, we're describing land use intensification and using it to describe conservation. Mm -hmm. And you find that in that part of the world, Someone will tell you that for a very long time this place has been more or less like a grassland. And, but when you come in our setting here, I just don't know how we are going to apply this particular knowledge because here if you're looking for a place that is under, for example, banana for that case, mm -hmm. it, it seems to change almost half a year. Mm -hmm. You don't have a, some, some of these places being constant. And I don't know how models are going to help us to capture that because in the first half of the year, someone is growing banana the next parties on cereals. And yet when you come to, I haven't been there, of course, I'm using theory. Mm -hmm. You seem to have a kind of land use uh, structures that don't change so fast. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how we are going to manage to factor this in because it's part of it's a, part something that you've already mentioned that you can combine climate change and land use. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, well, I don't know. Of course, there, there are places that you have a very clear type of land use, like agriculture, cattle raising, yeah. or urbanization, yeah. and stuff like that. And there are places that are more dynamic, like this one. Yeah. We also have this in, in Brazil. But I would <clears throat> try to minimize the types of land use and make it simple. Like, this is a place that has been used for uh, agriculture. This is essentially uh, agriculture. So that's the land use. It changes over time, 
but we will not be able to do anything with this place. It's not being used now, but it will be used next year because that is the dynamic. So you just do not, you don't want to consider this place in any kind of assessment because it will be used. It varies. It could be used for one year, maybe two, it could be left, and then they will get back to use it. But it's, it's a place that is being used for some kind of, of land use, like agriculture. The, the thing perhaps is that you should keep it simple, like four to, to five types of land use, that will be enough to characterize what places are good or not for doing something. Because if you go to some kind of vegetation map, like you have that one, you have so many things that you won't be able to select among them. There's so many options. Okay. Yeah. More questions? We shouldn't have a break, right? Okay. So this second part, I, I'm planning to talk a little bit more of, uh, about this software called zonation. That would be something about the zonation framework and software for uh, conservation prioritization. Uh, before I do that, because there is people here that have actually worked with this kind of softwares, uh, including zonation, and I've talked to you before, I would like to hear uh, some of your experiences. So what have you been doing with that and what are the, the problems you're facing, uh, like methodological problems, maybe uh, uh, communication problems and difficulties in trying to explain that to people. It would be good if you could share uh, this with, with me and with everybody so we can more or less know what are you guys doing with conservation and conservation planning. Is that okay? So any, anyone who wants to share uh, first can just start sharing. Dimbi. Yes. 